I'm Dr. Jennifer Abel, by the way. And this is a picture of some cute babies. Aren't they cute? Yeah. Don't think about babies. If you're like most people, you're still thinking about babies. <laughs> Daniel Wagner showed the people a picture of a white bear. And he said, don't think about the white bear. And then he showed the same picture to another group of people, and he said, it's okay to think about the white bear. Ten minutes later, he had them do a stream of consciousness, write down everything that came to their mind. And the people who were told to not think about the white bear were significantly more likely to be thinking about the white bear than the people who were given permission to think about the white bear. He did a follow-up study with worry, and he asked people, what do you worry about? So if I asked you, what do you worry about, and you said, I worry about what other people think of me, and I asked you, what do you worry about, and you said, I worry about money, and I told you, don't think about money. Ten minutes later, not only would you be more um, likely to be worried about money than you would about what other people think of you, that difference would be even greater than with the neutral white bear. And what do people tell us to do? What's the most common advice that we get when we're worrying? Don't think about it. Put it out of your mind. And that phenomenon we can see in this cartoon by Gary Larson. There's a guy in a body cast. And he says, man, Bernie, you're a mess. You ain't itching anywhere, are you? <laughs> boy, I had a cast on my, years, on my leg years ago. And boy, did it drive me nuts. Because you can't scratch it. So don't think about itching anywhere, Bernie, because it'll drive you nuts. So we know that fighting anxiety fuels anxiety. And I'd like for you to uh, put down your food for a moment. And we're going to do a short little experiment. I'd like for you to close your eyes and focus in your attention on the places in your body where you normally feel anxiety and stress. And I'm going to say some words. And I'd like for you to notice how you feel when I say these words. Calm down. Calming, calm, relax, relaxing, relax. And you can open your eyes again. So most of you did not choose calm down or relax. Most of you chose calming, relaxing, relaxed, calm. Because calm down and relax, I mean, how many times have people told you to calm down and you want to flip them off? <laughs> So we want to substitute those words and tell the people that are close to us to use those words like relaxing or calming rather than calm down. So another thing is rather than fighting anxiety and pushing away from anxiety, those relaxation strategies that I'm sure all of you have learned, we want to gently move toward those relaxation strategies. So instead of thinking, relax um, and focus on your breathing, gently shifting your attention to your breathing, noticing the surfaces beneath you, letting go of any tension that you don't need. And then acceptance. Acceptance is actually the opposite of fighting it. So if we accept and watch our worries, or we accept those difficult, uncomfortable feelings in our body, oftentimes they decrease. So we can use this uh, metaphor of the Chinese fender trap. The harder I try to get out of this Chinese fender trap, the more it grips me, the more uncomfortable I am. When I let go of that struggle and I no longer try to get free, I create room. I'm much less stuck. It's much more comfortable. And it's much easier for me to get out of it by using my thumbs. Teaching this metaphor to people who have problems with anxiety significantly reduced their anxious behaviors, thoughts, and physical sensations more than teaching them breathing retraining. And it takes 10 to 15 seconds to show that to you. And then instead of worrying, problem self. Turns out that worrying actually interferes with problem self. People who have generalized anxiety disorder, the worry disorder, turns out that those folks actually don't do as well at problem solving. And it's not because they're not good at problem solving. They have the skills, but it's the anxiety and the worry 
causes them to get stuck and prevents them from coming up with good solutions. So isn't it ironic that the very thing that they're trying to do is to make things turn out better, their worrying is actually interfering with that problem zone. And then we are terrible at not worrying. We see that from the white bear research. But we're actually pretty good at postponing the worry. So for instance, if you're worrying about work tonight and you can't get it off of your mind, you can say, you know what, I'm going to think about this on my commute tomorrow. And then gently shifting your attention to the taste of the food that you're eating and the smell of the food and maybe the surfaces beneath you. And then if you follow through with that and you actually do think about it the next morning and, and problem solve on your commute, you're going to be less likely to worry in between. This is also great if, for instance, you're thinking about your in-laws visiting for Thanksgiving and you're already worried about it. Maybe you've even been worried about it since June. But instead of trying to not worry about it, think about, well, what am I going to start preparing for the Thanksgiving holiday? Hmm. I'll probably start around, and you look at the calendar, maybe the weekend before is November 15th. I'll start preparing on November the 15th. So anytime that you worry about it, if you start to worry about it, you think, I'm going to postpone my thoughts and problem solve and start preparing on the 15th. It doesn't mean that you won't think about it, but when you think about it, you won't land on it and perseverate on it. It will be brief. Okay, so uh, the other thing is that worry occurs in a spiral. Worry occurs in a spiral of interactions between thoughts, images, physical sensations, and behaviors. Not everyone has all five of those symptoms, but for each person it follows a similar course each time. And the problem is that most of us wait until that spiral is out of control before we intervene. So for instance, let's say that I am a stay-at-home mom and, um, and I'm chopping vegetables. I'm waiting for my husband to come home from work, and I'm absolutely fine. I'm not really anxious, but I get the thought, boy, it seems like it's getting kind of late. I wonder what time it is, and with that, I get some tension in the back of my neck, and I drop my knife, I look over at the clock that is near the window, and when I see on that clock that it's getting late, the tension spreads to my shoulders, and I automatically look out the window without even thinking of it. And the instant I see that he's not coming, I get a pit in my stomach, and I start to feel fearful, and I may even have images of him being in a car wreck and hearing emergency vehicles in my mind, and I begin to pace between the fearfulness and the pacing, my heart starts to pound, and then I remember all of the times he's done this to me before, and I get frustrated does this to me all the time, he doesn't care, he doesn't understand, he'll get mad at me if I call him and up on him. And then I get an image of him in the hospital. And I worry then, what if I have to take care of him? What if I have to, what if, some, what if he dies? What if I take, have to take care of the kids without him? What if I lose the house? And then I think, oh, you know what, I should try that relaxation strategy that my therapist <laughs> I should try that for you. Not only is it going to be ineffective, it can actually make her worse because she can get frustrated that it's not working and feel hopeless and start to feel depressed that nothing will help. So the two reasons that our um, efforts to manage anxiety and worry fail is because we typically try to fight that anxiety, which kind of makes sense. You try to fight things that you don't want. But as we see, that's not effective. That's one thing. And the other thing is that we wait too long in that spiral to intervene. So we want to nip our anxiety in the bud, catch it before it goes, gets out of control. And in order to do that, we want to set up reminders because we're often not aware of our anxiety until it starts to get out of control. So what do we use frequently? <clears throat> These. Change the, um, change the uh, cell phone, the wallpaper on the cell phone, change the 
um, the text tones, the ring tones, or use sticky notes. Put them in places that you're going to see frequently as frequent reminders to use those relaxation strategies when you don't even need them, but without taking any time. So for instance, right now, all of you can be focusing on the surfaces beneath you. And I can be focusing on the surfaces beneath me. You do not need to stop listening, and I don't need to stop talking for us to be able to do that. So we want to do these strategies throughout the day, several times a day. With our housewife, imagine if we put a sticky note at the bottom of her block. And she's chopping her vegetables, waiting for her husband to come home from work. She gets the tension in the back of her neck, and she drops the knife, she looks at the clock, she sees that it's getting away from the sticky note, and that tension does spread to her shoulders, but she doesn't look out the window because she's reminded to go back and maybe use mindfulness, focusing on the sound of the chopping, tasting the vegetables, smelling what she's cooking, feeling that knife in her hand so when her husband comes home, oh, no, just kidding. <laughs> and we also want to use cognitive therapy. We see here a man who's looking at a book, Bright Break the Cycle of Negative Thinking. And uh, he thinks, well, I'd read it, but it probably wouldn't do any good. One of the biggest mistakes that people make with cognitive therapy is that they try to think the most positive thought, and they don't believe that positive thought. So we want to think better but believable thoughts. So with our housewife, when she's looking at that sticky note that fell off of her clock, um, she could I've worried about him hundreds of times and he's always fine. If there has been an accident, he's much more likely to be caught in the traffic than to be involved in the accident. He doesn't have the kind of job where he gets off at the same time every night. He's probably just running late. So thank you very much. That's the end of the TED Talk. So I'm going to open the floor for questions. No questions? Okay. So I have some more stuff.